Today's message uh, is the leaven of the Pharisees. <laughs> How many are excited to hear this message, huh? Oh, I'm super excited to preach it to all you evil Pharisaical folks. I'm just kidding. Let me find my file here. Let's read Mark chapter 12. Um, and uh, I'm going to start right there in verse 1. It says this, that Jesus began to speak to them in parables. And it says that, he, says, he, he speaks this parable. He says, there was a man that planted a vineyard and he set a hedge around it. He dug a place for the wine vat and he built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and he went away into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And so they took him, they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. Again, the man sent another servant. And at him, they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, the man sent another one into his vineyard and they did the same, but this time they killed him and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, one beloved son, he sent him to them last, saying, oh, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and he will destroy the vine dressers. And he will give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? That the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. And then in verse 12, they which are the religious leaders and the political leaders in the Jewish life, sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitude, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Father, I just pray that you would speak to us through this word today. That you would help us to understand how to guard our hearts from being like these religious leaders and political leaders in the days of Jesus. That God, we know that our hearts are the wellspring of life. We want to give grace. We want to share joy. We want to inspire people towards freedom. And so I pray today, God, help us to measure our own hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You know, when Jesus wanted to communicate a message, he used many times parables, or what are called stories with a little bit of a punch. He, uh, he used these stories to make the message stick in the minds and the hearts of his hearers. It's almost like he wanted them to, to you know, let down their guard and really look at themselves. I like what Warren Wearsby says. He says that a parable starts off as a picture. And then it, it, and it becomes familiar to the listeners, but then it quickly, as you begin to consider the picture, it becomes a mirror in which you see yourself. Did I put, that, did I put a little picture up there? I forget. A mirror in which you see yourself, and many people do not like to see themselves. Isn't that true? This explains why some of our Lord's listeners became angry when they heard his parables and they even tried to kill him. And in some ways it seemed as though they were successful. Now this parable in specific tells about a vineyard. And it's a warning that Jesus is giving to all of the temple leaders. To all of the religious and political leaders of the day in the temple saying that God's patience is running out. Because of your lack of repentance, because of your refusal of who the Messiah is. And so the temple rulers knew this and they were angry. And what was a public attempt at discrediting Jesus turned into a secret conspiracy to get him out of the picture. Now, there were oppositional groups 
all throughout the Gospels. And I want to just, I'm going to start in the beginning of Mark, and I want to just briefly touch on all the various oppositions that Jesus faced from these groups. The first one is in Mark chapter 2. We're not going to go to the, to the groups yet. Just, I'm just going to scope Scripture here first. In Mark chapter 2, it says they, the, the scribes came to Him and said, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So the first thing is, is who are you to forgive sins? And then, for those of you who know Scripture, He turns around and heals the paralytic and says, I've got the authority to, he, to forgive sin. Then in Mark chapter 2, verses 16 to 18, we find uh, the Pharisees find him eating with all the tax collectors and all the sinners. And they ask this question How is it that he, Jesus, eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Why are you dealing and living and communing with these undefiled people? And Jesus says, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to, to call the sick, to heal the sick, and to call the sinners to repentance. Then in that same chapter, in verse 18, the disciples of John and the Pharisees are fasting. And again they ask Him, why is it that your disciples don't fast? And Jesus plainly says to him, look, I'm here. Why does anybody have to fast? The bridegroom is among us. There's not the time of fasting right now. And they just, they just scratch their heads at this point. They're just wondering, who does this guy think he is? And then Mark chapter 2, verse 24, he's asked again another legal question. Look, why do your disciples do what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus responds back to him and says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Booyah! You know? <laughs> and they're like, you know, who do you think? And he's just trying to spin the law so that they see the heart of the law and not the details of it. And then, again, in chapter 3, now, the scribes start joining in. And uh, they say to him in verse 22, in, 20, in verse 22, he says, they say, to, say amongst themselves, Jesus, he has Beelzebub. By the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. See, they had seen him casting out unclean spirits. He'd seen, they'd seen demonic activity happening. And they're saying, well, these, this guy must be satanic and Jesus pipes back and he says if a house is divided against itself that house cannot stand how can I be casting out Satan if I'm Satan and and so he's just kind of just calling them to to their bluff now jumping into Mark 7 they catch him on tradition and the Pharisees and the scribes come to him in verse 5, and they say, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, that they eat bread with unwashed hands? So let me just siphon into a commercial for a minute. Shouldn't we all wash hands before we eat? <laughs> Especially in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> but they weren't talking about cleanliness. They were talking about ceremonial cleanliness. And Jesus says, you make the Word of God no effect through your tradition which you've handed down and the many things that you do. He says, your tradition is worthless. It's of no effect. Then they catch Him in Mark chapter 10. The scribes ch check Him with divorce and marriage. And the Pharisees come and they ask Him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus just flips the, the, the conversation. He says, let's not talk about divorce. Moses gave you divorce because you guys were screwing up the, the marriage. Let's celebrate marriage and not think about divorce. And then in Mark chapter 11, verse 28, the scribes and the chiefs, the chief priests here, they said to him, this is the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now there's more people involved. 
And they said to him, by what authority are you doing all these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus answers, says, I will ask you one question. Then you answer me. I will tell you by what authority I do these things. And he goes into the baptism of John. And then he basically says, you you, you don't know what you're talking about, so I'm not going to tell you by what authority I give this. I'm in control, not you. And then, and uh, actually I missed one in Mark chapter 8, backtrack just a little bit, they tried to get him to perform signs, kind of leans into this authority thing. See, what they tried to do, it says the Pharisees came out, they began to dispute with him, and they saw a sign. They said, do a sign for us, testing him. It's almost like they wanted him to be a genie in a bottle. You know what I mean? They wanted to say, let's see what you can do. And Jesus said, why do you seek a sign? This generation's not going to get any signs. I'm not going to show you any sign. I'm not going to tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. I'm the Son of God. You're not going to tell me how to perform. I'm going to perform when the Father tells me to, right? So then they get the Herodians involved. In chapter 12, now the Herodians add a whole new perspective to this because obviously by their names you know what they're about. And they catch him on this. Teacher, we know that you are true and you care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach us the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Jesus says, why do you test me? He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. See, they were trying to find out where does Jesus land on his political views? Where does he land? And Jesus basically balanced. He said, look it, I'm just going to be an obedient citizen to whatever government is in authority at the time. And then in Mark chapter 12, they finally get the Sadducees involved. And the Sadducees, as I'm going to share with you in a minute, these guys were the ruling government of of the day in the Jewish culture and in Jewish life. And the Sadducees come in and they go, listen, Moses wrote to us, this is verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 19. And they kind of go into this, I, I'm not going to go into it, but they kind of go into this thing about resurrection. And to make a long story short, they say, resurrection doesn't make sense, Jesus. How, 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 can, that, how can that make sense? It's, it's a foolish thought. It's a foolish belief. And uh, they didn't believe in supernatural things. And that's why they were not really liked by the Pharisees so much. And Jesus says to him, this is what Jesus says. I, 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 I like this. He says, are you not therefore mistaken about the resurrection? Because you do not know the Scriptures nor the power of God. You're limiting the power of God through your mind. And through what you think makes sense. He's basically saying, you got finite minds. You got finite understanding. You can't, you ain't got a clue of the mind of God. And then the very last challenge is in Mark chapter 14 in front of the Sanhedrin. And the high priest says to Jesus, Are you the Christ? the Son of God, the Son of the Blessed One. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. We have to understand something. That Jesus' ministry, when He stepped into His ministry, within three years, this man gained just unprecedented popularity. I mean, he was casting demons out. He was walking on water. He was feeding the 5,000. He was hanging out with people that nobody else wanted to hang out with. And yet, somehow he made that right and okay. He was teaching uh, teachings that were just blowing people's minds. And he was gaining influence among the Jewish life. The people were beginning to follow him. But just as much as he was rising in influence, there was opposition rising at the same time. And it comes to a head, doesn't it? 
Now, I want to talk, biblical history tells us, and I want to try to do this as brief as I can, biblical history tells us there were five groups of, of opposition to Jesus. The first one is, many of you know, and this is the big one that everybody you know, uh, knows in, in Christian circles, and that's the Pharisee. The Pharisee, you could say, was the religious experts. More than 98 times, this group is referenced in the Gospel. Pharisee means separated one. This group of men had a good beginning. They started, Pharisees started in the time of Daniel and his three friends when they were in Babylon. They clung to the law to preserve their identity as Jews. So it was a righteous beginning. But at the time of Jesus, this Pharisees had become like a brotherhood, like a sorority group, kind of like um, on a college campus. And there were a rite of passage. They had, to, they had to, before they could become a Pharisee, they had to stand in front of three witnesses and pledge their allegiance to the law. They also had to adhere to seven times a day praying. They had to have times of prayer. They also had to take one-tenth of all their possessions and they had to give it to the temple. They also fasted twice a week to commemorate the law in which Moses gave. And then the big thing was they, had, um, they were a part of ceremonial washings and uh, specifically the, uh, the code of conduct on the Sabbath. So this was the big thing. So they took the law of the Sabbath and they categorized it into 39 categories. Basically, 39 do-nots. And listen to this. This, this is the 39 do-nots, 39 prohibitions on the Sabbath. You were not allowed, if you were a Pharisee, you were not allowed, um, you, you were not allowed for carrying, burning, extinguishing, finishing, writing, erasing, cooking, washing, sewing, tearing, knotting, untying, shaping, plowing, planting, reaping, harvesting, threshing, winnowing, selecting, sifting, grinding, kneading, combining, spinning, dyeing, chain stitching, warping, weaving, unraveling, building, demolishing, trapping, shearing, slaughtering, skinning, yes, and even tanning, smoothing, and marking. And we thought we had it bad in New York State. <laughs> now in contrast to the other groups that I'm going to explain here in a minute, the Pharisees were actually, they were real true men of God. They had a righteous ambition to see the kingdom of God on the earth. They were waiting for the Messiah. They believed that God was in charge of human history and not man. And they gave their whole life to see the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The second group were the Sadducees. These were the opposite side of the Pharisees. They were what you could consider social organizers. They were the governing authority in the days of Jewish life. They were made up of wealthy, socially minded people. Their spiritual depth was very limited. They rejected supernatural activity, and they were strongly opposed to all of the Pharisees' beliefs about resurrection and all of these other things. The Sadducees have their roots back in the time of King David and Solomon, where Zadok the priest helped Solomon become the next king and take the throne. And Zadok was instrumental in that, and he was, and that's kind of where the Sadducees began. They were, and that's why they became so entwined with the temple. And the Sadducees were in, were in charge of the temple. They they took care of the upkeep of the temple. They they managed the business of the temple. So wherever the animal sacrifices were, they, they were the ones in charge of all that. So think about when Jesus walked into the temple and flipped the tables. How that threatened their government and their leadership in that Sanhedrin. They didn't like that so much. And so Sadducees, politically, they landed in the middle. They weren't radical, but they weren't passive. But they were given autonomous leadership from Rome. Meaning, Rome said, you create your own laws, you create your own ways of governing, and they created a supreme council called the Sanhedrin. 
And that's where they convicted Jesus. And in fact, Caiaphas the high priest, which is biblically considered the architect of of Jesus' crucifixion, he's the one who devised the plan, and then that meeting at the Sanhedrin when he said, are you the Christ, it was pretty much right there that Jesus secured his conviction and that took him to the cross. But it was the Sanhedrin's. It was the Sadducees of the Sanhedrin that really did that. The third group are the scribes. Now these people really aren't a group. These are actually professional legalists. They were lawyers and teachers and educators. And their whole job was to, to write every detail of the law onto these holy scrolls. A scribe could be a Pharisee, depending on their beliefs. Or a scribe could be a Sadducee. But a scribe was a profession. And the problem with the scribes, so, so the scribes have their time back in Ezra, when Ezra was the first scribe. Ezra was the one who said, we need to get, the, we need to get this back into the hands of the people of Israel. We need to get them reading the law and knowing exactly what it says. And so that's what the scribes were about. They wanted to make sure that every word, every detail, every sentence was understood and was to the, you know, every I dotted, every T crossed. And that was the problem that Jesus had with the scribes because they were so, so entrenched in the detail that they missed the heartbeat. That's why they were so upset when he did things like on the Sabbath, when he ate with tax collectors. When he healed people on the Sabbath, when he when he uh, you know did things that were defiling and were it just didn't seem like they added up to the law, and uh, and that's that was the big issue with the scribes. Now, the next one, these last two are more political. There were Herodians, which are political opportunists. Their whole aim could be summed up this way: keep. Herod on the throne. These are people who saw Herod as a favorable political leader for Jewish life. Somehow they saw that life as a Jew was better with Herod on the throne. And so they pursued an influence among the Jewish people to really, you know, let's parade Herod, let's, let's exalt Herod, let's keep Herod happy. And the Heronians didn't really get too involved with Jesus until the Pharisees knocked on their door and said, hey, we need you. Because see, the most influential people in Jewish culture were the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Zealots, who I'm about to share with you. They were influential people. They were the ones that created movements to be able to shape Jewish culture and Jewish belief and Jewish social life. And so the Pharisees said, I don't like what Jesus is doing. I don't think he's the Messiah. And I know you've got an agenda for Herod. Hey, why don't we come together and find out how we can get this thing taken care of and get him out of the picture? And then not only that, they also um, they, they came together and they began to talk to the scribes and trying to figure out the law. How is Jesus really logistically, you know... Um, doing wrong things. And then they brought their case to the Sanhedrin, to the Sadducees. And see how all four of those worked? All four of those groups worked together to conspire a conspiracy to get Jesus out of the picture and to kill Him. They all, they all had different agendas, but they all worked together to destroy Jesus. Something to think about in a minute. The fifth and last one are the zealots. These you could be called radical nationalists. I remember I played... Uh, in an Easter drama, Simon the Zealot. And, uh, you know, these are guys that some were peaceful, but others were very radical. They created riots and, and revolts. Um, and they, they basically wanted Herod off the throne. So they were opposite Herodians. They said, no rule but, but the law and no king but God. They wanted their freedom. They wanted less government. And they wanted to have freedom. And so they, they did what they could do to, uh, to make that happen. And so Jesus, many scholars believe that Jesus uh, limited his ministry to various places based upon what these zealots 
might have done if he walked into that, into that region. They were afraid if he walked in, they may have created a ruckus. And so he restricted himself from going various places so that he didn't create a stir with these crazy radicalists. Now, why do I share all these things? This is biblical history. I think that it was important for you to understand these groups because there's a heart behind it. There's a spirit behind these groups. And I believe that according to what Jesus said, I believe the spirit of these groups are still in action today. We may not be Pharisees by name. We may not be Sadducees by name. We may not be a scribe or a Herodian or a zealot, but we definitely carry sometimes the leaven of these people. And that's what Jesus said. You can put up the picture of the leaven for a minute. In Mark chapter 8, verse 15, Jesus said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians. The reason He said the leaven is because the leaven, the Jews were supposed to eat unleavened bread. Not leavened bread. Leavened bread is like this. Like when I make my son's gluten-free bread, all right, Dwayne and Shannon are starting to figure this out. And you get this little yeast packet, active dry yeast from, uh, what is it, Steinman's or whatever, right? And you get that and you sprinkle it, go back, go back to the picture, and you sprinkle it into the dough, and then that yeast works into the dough and causes the dough to rise, and that means it's leavened bread. So you get the next picture, you get this puffed up piece of bread as opposed to a flat bread, right? Isn't it interesting how Jesus used this analogy that sometimes when we allow sin, pride to begin to infiltrate our soul, we get puffed up. And the reality is, is in, in, uh, in this time frame, Jews understood that leaven was impure because they were commanded to eat unleavened bread. It reminded them of how quick they had to leave, Israel, uh, leave Egypt during the Passover. Remember? They left Egypt. They had to leave quick. They couldn't put leaven in the bread and allow it to rise. Jesus said, take unleavened bread. And so it reminds them that this is an impure thing. Now, Jesus also talked about this idea of, of toxins or of things infiltrating your soul in your life to make you defiled and to make you unclean and make you not suitable for His kingdom. And He used this in Mark chapter 7. He talked about the heart and the stomach. In Mark chapter 7, verses 14-23, through 23, this is what Jesus says. <clears throat> Let me find it. He says, When He had called all the multitudes to Himself, He said, Hear Me, everyone, and understand this. There's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. He goes on to say, if you drop down to verse 18, he says, Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it doesn't enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all the foods. Now, if you look at the stomach, the stomach is a digestive organ, right? And in fact, you can live without it. It's not essential. And so stuff comes into the stomach and it goes out. That's all that it's there for. It's a digestive organ. The heart, on the other hand, is a major component to your life. And if you ain't got it working, you ain't living. If you look at all the veils, that means there is blood being pushed through all those veils and they go through all your body. And so when a disease like leukemia hits you or a cancer hits you and begins to infect your blood, it begins to send that bad blood cells and that infection all through your body until you start making symptoms of being sick. You, you begin to get a disease and then eventually you die. Blood and the heart are a huge component of life. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, it's not about what is on the outside. It's about what's pumping on the inside. 
What's pumping into your soul? You're so worried about what's coming at you and what's coming in you and what's attacking you. He's saying, take a look at what's attacking yourself on the inside. The result of a Pharisee, the result of these, these attitudes is that they kill grace. They kill grace. They steal joy. A person with an attitude like a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a religious, they're the type of people who who steal the joy in the moment. And they destroy freedom. Destroy it. They're very dangerous people. It's a very dangerous attitude. Now how might we know if we carry these attributes? Well, I, I want to just share with you real quick. Kerry Newoff is a leader that I am, um, a blogger, a, a church leader that I read often. He has this article on, you might be a Pharisee if you say things like. <laughs> so it's a litmus test. I'll, let me just read some of these off. So that, and, and He says, you might be a Pharisee if you say things like, well, if he knew the Bible as well as I did, his life would be better. I follow the rules. Hey, you shouldn't hang around people like that. God listens to my prayers. <laughs> Sure, I have a few issues, but that's between me and God. (laughs) They just need to work harder. (laughs) Oh, we don't say that in this pandemic, do we? Of course I'm a Christian. You just might be a Pharisee if you have to say something. Of course I'm a Christian, can't you tell? More people need to stand up for Christian values. I'm just simply more comfortable with people from my church than I am with people who don't go to church. This is one that, hit, that has hit me and uh, often. People who don't go to church, they can come if they want to. Why is that a problem? Because it's based on my preference. This is the way I do church. If they want to come in, that's between them and their desire. I'm going to keep doing it the way I want to do it. That's a Pharisee. Now listen to me. The challenge is to not point the finger. I'm only preaching this message because I am a recovering Pharisee addict. (laughs) And I know when I point a finger like this, there are three more pointing back at me. Today's message is not about trying to find the Pharisees in the world. Today is to look in the mirror. To look and focus on the three fingers that are pointing back at you. Say, God, forgive me if I have or if I've carried any of these kinds of things. I want to leave you with two things to guard yourself against. The pride of privilege and the hypocrisy of holiness. Proverbs says that we are to guard our hearts for out of it the wellsprings of life come. If you think you're something and you have a privilege because of because whether you're an American or whether you're because a Christian or whoever you are, if you allow pride to be built into the privilege of who you are, you are going to be self-destructive. And if you hypocrisy, if you hypocritically live your life in front of people and in secret, you've got major, major faults. I want to say that I am extremely disappointed 
in Rabbi Zacharias. And for those of you who know him as a great apologist and what has come out about his morality and his ethics is extremely disheartening. But I have to say to myself, God, let that not be of me. I can point my finger at Zacharias, but i got to remember, what about me? What is in me that is self-destructing? What is about me that maybe there are some things, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not as bad as that or whatever, but maybe there are some things in me that I need to get rid of and get my mind off of Rabbi and get my mind on, who am I? So how do we do this? And I want to leave you with just five more things. (laughs) How do we guard our hearts from these two things? First, be honest about your own sin. Be honest. You got problems? Be honest about it. It's so easy to point out everybody else's flaws and everybody else's sin and then put a, put, you know, a, a, a blind eye or a, a deaf ear to what's going on in you. So easy. So easy to point out other people's sin other than pointing your own sins out. Do you know some of you have got serious blinders on when it comes to your sin? And if you just sat down and thought about what kind of person you are and some of the things, and you could play back your life, you would say to yourself, man, i got to be honest, I'm a piece of... Be honest about yourself. Be honest with yourself. Second, live for the approval of God. Paul says, am I, am I trying to please man or am I trying to please God in this point in my life? It's so easy to get wrapped up in what others think about you and how they see you. And we, we, this is what we do. We live instead. We live, we live on the stages in, of, of, of humanity and all the people are watching us perform when God says, get off the stage. Stop trying to please everybody in the world. Your world is not a stage. Make your world a secret place with me. Get in the secret place and let me tell you how I'm pleased with you. Let me tell you how I love you. Let me tell you how you are purposeful and, you're, and, and I'm proud of you and I'm blessed by your ministry instead of looking for everybody else to tell you that. All too often, we're looking for these standing ovations when God's looking for a kneeling heart. Thirdly, shout the grace of God for everyone to hear. If I could tell you, there is nothing that I've done that puts me in this position. If I was measured by what I've done, I would fall short every time. I am a product of the grace of God. I have made... See, Tom even agrees. See that? (laughs) We make mistakes. If we don't have the grace of God, we ain't got nothing. Nothing. Are people more amazed by you or by the grace of God that's at work within you? Shout it. Shout it to the rooftops, man. When you're witnessing to somebody, don't impress them with your thoughts on Scripture. Impress them with how much God has changed your life. Don't impress them with your apologetics. Don't impress them with your charisma. Don't impress them with how much you know or how much you think you know about them. Impress them with the God in whom you serve. The One who has healed you, redeemed you, set you free. That's why it's so important to have 10,000 or more reasons why God is good. Maybe it's time for the church to stop shouting their praises and start shouting God's praises. Fourth, avoid 
the fruit, the exhaustion of fruitless tradition. If you're doing something just because you've done it for so many years and it's not producing any fruit, get rid of it. Well, I've been going to church for a long time. You know, it's not about cutting church out. It's not about cutting and reading the Bible out. It's about changing and looking at your ways of worshiping in a different way. Sometimes you sing the same songs over and over and over again. Sometimes you read the same passages of Scripture over and over and over again. Jesus came in and challenged those men, think differently about the law. Look at it differently. Spin it differently. Think about your life differently. Think about your life instead of consuming yourself with all 39 of those stupid do-not-dos. Think about what the Sabbath really is about. Spin your life differently. Some of you need to spin your life differently. Spin ministry differently. That's what this pandemic has done. It's given us an opportunity to look at our worship in a different way. We serve the same God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But hear me out. Sometimes the way we worship changes because life changes. Enroll with it. Don't exhaust yourself by keeping something going that is supposed to die. And lastly, this is my favorite one. Slow down with compassion. I heard someone preach once. Someone said, I don't know where I, I don't remember where I heard it, but he said, you need to walk slowly. Walk slowly. When you go to the grocery store, when you go to the bank, when you're driving down the road, it's so easy to be busy about our own lives, our own agendas, where we need to be, where we need to go, what we're trying to accomplish. Remember what Jesus was. He was a man who walked slowly. He turned around. He knelt down. He sat at a table and ate dinner. He looked up, stopped at a tree and said, hey, I'm going to have dinner with you tonight. He walked slowly and he observed people. How do they hurt? What do they need? What do I have that they need? Sometimes we need to walk through our neighborhoods and look at a house and just say, and just stop for a minute. Don't be a kook. Just stop and say, what, what's going on in there that I can pray about? You get me? Sometimes we need to slow down. All too often, I, I, I'll just share this story and then I'll close. Uh, I was at, the, at BJ's and uh, Stacy and I were getting groceries and finally we had time away. It was just her and I getting groceries together and we didn't have the kids, but there was a single mom there all by herself with four kids and they were running all around and I'm thinking to myself, holy cow, boy, I know how that goes. And, uh, and it was easy in that moment to say, you know, not, I, I didn't say this, but um, I can see where it would be easy to say, can't that mother get control of her kids? In fact, people have said that to Stacy and I in the, in the store. Have corrected our children in front of us, corrected us. But never once has anybody ever stopped us in a grocery store and said, how can I help you? Can I buy you a gallon of milk for your kids when they see four of them in the cart? We as people are looking for the next stimulus check or we're looking for a government to change when the reality is God's saying, look, we have the influence in culture. 
Stop allowing the Pharisees and the scribes and, and the Sadducees and all of these people in government trying to control and form their agenda. You have the power to change this world one person at a time because you have the Spirit of Jesus Christ in living inside of you. Warren Wearsby said, I started with this quote, that a parable oftentimes is like a mirror. It causes you to look at yourself. And then he, con- then he continues on and he says that mirror often becomes a, a window. A window in which God's grace can come in. And I thought about that for a minute because many of our windows look like that. Stained glass. When all that people see is what we've painted on the outside and on the surface. A window is meant, go back to the other one, the window is meant to be clear and open. To allow a fresh breath, breath, a fresh wind to change the environment in which we live. Amen?